And so when we looked at compliance with Common Article 3, our focus and our effort was to look at today's conditions and to look ahead for the next 12 months to see what steps the camp needed to, to continue to take in order to maintain compliance. It was very important for us to, to contact outside groups, to hear from NGOs, to hear from uh, habeas counsel represented in their writings uh, in the public domain, as well as those who contacted us directly through written correspondence. The value of doing that is it tested our assertions. It tested our operating procedures. I was not in a position to look back. I was not in a position to go back to the many years of camp experience and determine whether or not some action had taken place in the camp's history. That was not our goal. That was not our effort. The way I see this, Jim, is that the role that we play is that we are the first in a series of steps in the executive order uh, towards the um, uh, termination of Guantanamo. And in my view, our role is to really address the number one priority of the national leadership team, which is to answer the question, is it in compliance today? And our review says that it is. And a follow-up then. In that regard, did you talk to any de current detainees directly? About a dozen is uh, outlined in our, in our report. And did you find any claims of torture among any of those you talked to? Uh, we heard allegations of abuse and um, what we did at that point was to go back and investigate the allegation. Uh, in this specific case, there was a detainee who claimed that he was abused and beaten during a forced cell extraction. Uh, that's when a, a team of guards comes in to physically pick up and move the detainee if, uh, if, if there's a requirement to move him somewhere. That would be the kind of conditions. Typically for those who are on a hunger strike, um, this means picking them up and moving them then to an area where we would feed them. Uh, this is an area of, um, of uh, great concern to outside groups as well. And uh, in this particular case, we were able to go back to video of the forced cell extraction. We were able to see what events actually took place. And we realized um, there were actions that the detainee had taken ahead of time that, that allowed the, the team to now respond the way they did. So. In many respects, um, what I think is important to point out is that when there's an allegation of abuse, there is a means of following up. So in terms of how I look at whether or not the command is in compliance with Common Article 3, when there's an allegation of abuse or misconduct, the number one thing I'm going to look for is, is there a systemic problem here? How does the chain of command now react and respond to this allegation? And what we found in the course of our review is that there are iterative steps that now the oversight and leadership take part in actively in order to determine whether or not this particular allegation was substantiated. I would also share with you that in the course of our work, we did look at uh, guard records. We looked at, at, in other words, our own report card on ourselves. Uh, what we found is that there were, uh, in some cases, substantiated uh, evidence where guards had uh, misconduct, and I think would be the best way to put it. That will be in the report as well. What the report will read is that we found uh, 20 uh, allegations, 14 substantiated, and then we will lay out what particular actions were taken in all of those uh, cases. So this is non-judicial punishment, this is reprimand, uh, this is relieving people of their jobs on the spot. For, for the audience here to understand what kind of threshold have we crossed when we talk about misconduct on the part of the guards, uh, had a chance to review uh, a number of different um, substantiated cases that came before us. And on, on the one end is uh, gestures, comments, disrespect. On the other end was the preemptive use of pepper spray. This is a case where a guard had, had been uh, hit with bodily fluids twice previously with the same detainee. He saw the detainee starting to move towards him and he preemptively used pepper spray. We, we consider that uh, a move that was misconduct, uh, not necessary, not provoked, even though understood, and he was relieved. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of how we bound the problem here and what we're looking at. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell us more about the socialization issue? Why, why is that important? Is it, is it a mental health issue? Um, and how would you describe the mental health of the detainees there overall? Yeah. And, and well, I'll ask how that about if, I, if I take those two okay. and then see if I've answered your question. Okay. First of all, we did look for mental health pathologies, and we looked for empirical evidence to suggest that the detainees had uh, some spikes in mental health problems. What you'll find in the report is we'll report 8% of the detainees 
with uh, mental health issues that require medication, which is substantially below uh, a comparable population in the United States. But to your point, uh, I need to, to be very clear on this. Uh, I come in as an operator with a fresh set of eyes and, a, and what I hope would be a common sense approach to a number of issues starting to, to uh, play out after prolonged detention. And in my view, uh, what's really important here is to recognize that the Geneva standard for be humane is written in terms of what we can see and therefore what we can influence. Specifically, if you look at Geneva and ask, uh, you know, what does this mean to be humane? What you get is an answer that describes the floor. It describes adequacy. It describes sufficiency. And it's on food, it's on water, it's on shelter, and it, the ability to practice religion. So what we're doing here in this report is we're saying there's another dimension to this that we have to look at, and that's mental welfare. And we think that's critically important. I'm not a behavioral scientist coming into it, but I'm looking at a period of prolonged detention. I'm looking at uh, people, uh, particularly in certain camps, and this is Camp 7 to be specific, where uh, the conditions that were originally designed for Camp 7 may have been satisfactory and may have been humane then, but what we're uh, what we're taking advantage of with the review team is we're also looking ahead at the next 12 months. And I can't tell you uh, definitively if this is a threshold that we cross uh, in six months or six weeks, but the point is, why wait? Why wait in, in order to have empirical evidence to say, we've got a statistical problem with mental health here. Why not get in front of this? Why not recognize that key to the Islamic religion is being able to practice prayer as a community. Uh, the ability to interact uh, person to person is critically important for folks to be able to socialize and to be able to be intellectually stimulated. Uh, so that's the uh, perspective that we're bringing to this discussion. Uh, just to follow up, will you allow high profile detainees to interact more with other detainees and, and is there a risk there? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought out the risk because in the report it's important to talk about risk because uh, if, if that's all you saw, then you would move to a more communal population for the entire detainee population, and that is not practical. So the risk management now is critically important to the uh, joint detention group commander down there who makes that decision moment to moment. And so he has to decide whether or not uh, by providing uh, more interaction for detainees in one camp versus another, uh, whether or not that uh, cons is consistent with what his intel is telling him and whether or not uh, that makes sense from a force protection point of view. Uh, in the case of Camp 7, I think there's opportunities for social interaction without mingling uh, Camp 7 with any other camp. Uh, this is a matter of interacting with more people who are there. In fact, uh, rulings have, have come out that have directed that uh, at least five of, of the members uh, who are co-conspirators could uh, interact with themselves every two weeks. Uh, this is this is part of what's already in play. So I think we should recognize where the courts are in this as well. For how long a period of time, that interaction? Um, it's every, two weeks. every two weeks, the length of time, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can get back to you for the record, but, uh, uh, but the point is it's unmonitored, okay? And that's, that's by the court ruling, yeah. Uh, your, your report uh, underlines the, uh, the importance of trying to solve um, uh, the issue of dead knees who are still in Guantanamo, but um, although there, there was a court order to to free them, uh, to, to solve that um, issue uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, have you had the opportunity to, to meet the Chinese Uyghurs who are still in Guantanamo? And um, have you noticed, I mean, are, are you particularly concerned about their mental health? Uh, you've mm -hmm. talked about anxiety. Can you develop on that? Uh, well, where the, um, where the Uyghurs are currently held is an area that allows for um, a very communal sort of atmosphere. So they are able to interact with themselves uh, as much as they want. Uh, the real issue here is not so much the, the effect that this is having on the Uyghurs, although they are very exasperated by this process. Uh, the real issue is that everybody else in the camp is watching. So everyone knows. Uh, we have the executive order posted, so everyone knows that the camp uh, will close, that Guantanamo will close in 12 months. But they're expecting movement. And when these are the rest of the detainee population. And when they don't see the Uyghurs, who it should be a very clear-cut sort of solution for them, that they would be able to move on and repatriate in another location. Uh, when they see that as complicated and, and what may appear to be slow to them, uh, 
the detainees find that very frustrating. 